Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. This is the home of public programs for UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is KJ Ralph. I'm a film programmer with the Archive, and it's my distinct honor to welcome you to night one of our weekend with the visionary filmmaker, Mary Lambert. <laughs> So we are gathered tonight for the world theatrical premiere of the new 4K digital restoration of 1989's Pet Cemetery, <laughs> followed by 1992's Pet Cemetery 2 on a 35 millimeter print from Paramount. We really want to thank Jack Derwood and the entire team at Paramount for facilitating the loan to us and for authoring a brand new DCP specifically for this occasion. So this is the first time this DCP has played anywhere. Um, thank you, Jack. We would also like to thank Todd Weiner and our entire collections team at UCLA Film and Television Archive for handling the intake of so many of Ms. Lambert's personally held film materials for safekeeping, which are now officially on deposit with us at the archive, and we're so happy to have that work here with us. Additionally, I would like to send a very special and heartfelt thanks to Randy Yantek, our digital lab manager at the archive, who personally scanned and in some cases color corrected 12 unique moving image materials from Ms. Lambert's deposit, including the four music videos you saw on the screen as you entered the theater tonight. Um, Randy's very sad to be out of the country on a much deserved vacation, but um, I'm sure he wanted Mary and everyone here to know how much he would have loved to be here for tonight's screening. So thank you, Randy. So this is all to say that this entire weekend would not have been possible without the help of many people, including J.D. Sobel, Ms. Lambert's manager. Thank you, J.D., for everything, for all the phone calls and all the organizations. We've been planning this since January, if you can believe it. Um, I also want to thank Marissa Soto in our communications department and our friends at Friday Night Frights for helping to promote this weekend of screenings. And of course, a huge thank you to April Wolf, who back in January of this year, sent me a text message about the film we're playing tomorrow night, Siesta, and was adamant that we bring Mary to Los Angeles to celebrate her singular vision and her early film work. So April, that text was the start of something great, and you'll hear more from April after the screening of tonight's first film um, as she moderates the Q&A with various cast and crew from both Pet Cemetery films. A filmmaking artist with visual panache and a distinct ability to humanize occultic sensibilities, director Mary Lambert has consistently channeled her interior mindscapes. Lambert has an innate ability to manifest deeply emotional genre fables, and during her nearly four decades of filmmaking, has established a unique visual lore, all of her own design. To talk a little bit about tonight's two films, before we all enjoy them together. It's now my distinct pleasure to welcome to the Wilder stage, filmmaker Mary Lambert. Hey everybody, thank you so much for coming and uh, thank you also to KJ and April and everybody at UCLA and Randy who's not here. They, the archivists here have done such an amazing job with old one inch magnetic tape that you can't even believe. Uh, I can't believe it. People told me to throw this stuff away, that it was, it was un, unusable, it was garbage. And I knew it wasn't, I knew it wasn't. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm gonna keep this, this part of it short and sweet because we're gonna have a really good Q&A. There's some people here who really know where the bodies are buried. Uh, and they're gonna be on the stage with me uh, in between the two movies. So, uh, you know, think about what your questions are. Uh, and also, you're going to have to think in advance about what your questions are about PET 2, because we'll, we'll, we'll do the Q&A for that um, before, before we screen it. Um, I will tell you that I was seven months pregnant when we wrapped PET 2, in case somebody wants to ask about that. Uh, I will tell you, uh, that's all I'm going to tell you. Um, <laughs> Uh, once again, um, thank you so much for coming.
So just a quick reminder, uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell this audience, but please refrain from talking during the film. And of course, turn off your cell phones, put them away for the duration of the screening. The only screen that should be illuminated is this one. Um, and we'll have ushers coming in to check in um, about every 15 minutes just to make sure that you're all behaving yourselves. Um, I also want to thank you all you know, for coming to the Wilder tonight and in doing so, supporting the programs of UCLA Film and Television Archive. Your continued support and patronage really guarantees our ability to showcase exciting and important movies year round and to always support the work of female filmmakers throughout cinematic history. So thank you so much for coming and now enjoy Pet Cemetery. Are we on? We're on. Um, I'm April Wolf and I'm so excited that you all are here for this amazing double feature that we have today. Um, let me introduce some folks to the stage. Uh, we've got Mary Lambert wandering on. <laughs> and we also have Mika Hu, sorry, Mika Hughes here. And we've got Dale Midkip here. And we got Brad Greenquist here. And we've got Tom Fine in here too, editor of Pet Cemetery 2. And if everyone wants to take a seat. And Tom Finnan. Tom Finnan. <laughs> who, who is? Yeah, you should. Why, why did you jump up on this stage? <laughs> Pascal, Brad Greenquist. And, and Dale, Dale McKip, as Lewis Creed. All right. Can I sit next to Of course. It's a Is this the first time you guys have gotten together in a little while? No. Father and son? No. <laughs> We've done conventions for years. Oh, wow. Yeah, all of us. Yeah, with Denise, too. We miss Denise. Oh, yeah, Denise was, she was sad that she could not make I'm it, sure, I think. Because, you know, I mean, you know, Denise is our friend and loves Mary. And Denise and I are close. Yeah. She's, she's on set, though. She's working. She's working, thank God. Yeah, good for her. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes Andrew is with us as well, who played um, uh, Zelda. Uh, at the conventions, but we haven't done anything like this in LA ever, have we? No, I think this is the first. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is a rarity for all of you. Uh, I'd like to open up this Q and A portion with something revolving around the title of this weekend, which is "Spirits in the Sky." You've mentioned, Mary, in many interviews that spirituality is something that is not really discussed or shown in modern culture except for in horror films and that it's a place where you can actually talk about spirituality and that maybe it's changing right now but it wasn't a big part of pop culture for a while. This film is very much about spirituality both overt and covertly and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and the meaning of this for you. Okay well uh, basically the theme of this movie is a, it's about accepting death, um, which is a taboo subject uh, mostly. Most people don't want to talk about death or think about death or accept death um, or old age for that matter. Um, and um, uh, talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's she about. also doesn't want to talk about death. I don't want to so. talk about death either. Um, uh, th the the movie's about obsession. Um, when it was presented to me as a possibility, I thought it was kind of, um, I backed off from it at first because I didn't really think of myself as a horror director at the time. I just directed Siesta. Um, and uh, then I realized that Siesta was about obsession. And this movie is about obsession also. And it's about um, being so obsessed with someone that you can't accept their death and you can't allow them to move on uh, into another reality. Um, and uh, the death of a child, of course, is, is particularly distressing. The death of a pet is particularly distressing to a child. Uh, and many children, this is the first way that they experience death, um, is w when one of their pets die. And uh, if anyone who has a child or is contemplating having a child, uh, will have to, one of the things you have to deal with as you raise a child is you have to tell them about death because they don't know about death. They're not 
you're not born understanding death. A child does not understand death. Um, and it's really difficult to look a child. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing people that have children that, that it, it's really, really, really difficult to look at a small child that you love and explain to them that someday you're going to die and leave them. Um, and someday they're going to die and be gone. It, it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible moment, but it's also a, an incredibly intense moment. Um, and you don't, you know, you don't really want somebody else to be the person that, that explains that to your child, really. Uh, uh, if you, I think it's important that parents or that somebody that loves the child explains that to the child. Um, and that's kind of, that's kind of what this movie is about, is, is um, sharing that, sp that spiritual, <laughs> making that into a spiritual moment rather than into a lie, mm -hmm. which is unfortunately what Lewis Creed does. That's his, uh, you know, he makes that first, that first error, and then he compounds the error, and then he compounds the error, and then he absolutely goes like off most the, men. Yeah. He goes off the rails. <laughs> he goes off the rails. <laughs> okay, that enough for that answer. Oh no, I okay. want you to keep going. <laughs> Definitely keep going. Um, and then in this case, you have to look at a child and know that they're going to potentially murder you. Um, I'm. I. This is this is a script that was famous because it was an actual adaptation that Stephen King wrote of his own book. And I was wondering what you were thinking as you guys were going through the process and you realized that a very scary character was going to have to be a very, very young child. Well, he's here on the stage with us. <laughs> um, I'll just briefly say that I was deeply encouraged. In fact, I had to make an issue out of it with um, with the executives on the movie because they wanted to hire twins. But as soon as I met Nico, and he probably doesn't remember, um, we just bonded. And I knew that he wanted to be, that he wanted to act, that he wanted to, that he was going to act for me, that he was going to become. And because it, the, you know, the uh, popular knowledge, the popular opinion, the popular whatever, uh, consensus, is that you should just hire twins because they can't. They're too young to act. They're too young to like uh, participate as a as a artist or a create creator. Uh, and so you just get the twins and you just photograph them. And when one twin gets tired, you just bring the other twin in. And Miko doesn't have a twin, <laughs> but I still felt that we had, I went through the casting process and that that that. He was the right person for the part. Do you remember any of it? And I'm forever thankful for that, <laughs> that you, you trusted and believed in me that I, I could handle what most people would think of twins would have to do. So <laughs> forever changed my he life. He did the work so of two you. men is all I can say. At age two, <laughs> he did you. the work of two men. <laughs> yeah, do you remember the casting process at all? I don't remember the audition, definitely. <laughs> the, the nerves, you know, studying the lines and trying not to crap my pants. and. <laughs> Um, How'd that work out? <laughs> limited success. Um, yeah, no, I I don't remember anything else about being two. But I think because this has been such a big part of my life, the stories have been repeated over and over. Perhaps they're memories of memories, um, but it's 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 probably the the earliest things I can remember. Well, he, I mean, Miko learned really to take hit his mark. To you know, to not to wait till action, like lots of things that adult actors have trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I am curious. One of the lines that my husband and I quote to each other constantly when we want to unnerve the other one is, "I want to play with you," <laughs> and I need to I need to know a little bit more about the recording of that dialogue were you doing that in ADR was that in scene w what was that process like trying to get these really interesting lines from Miko you, Mary probably knows more of that to my knowledge it was on on the day I, I don't know if we did any ADR for well, any of that Tom Tom was there for both both pet one and pet two yeah. and he's gonna know he's gonna remember maybe more than either Miko or I do we 
my recollection is the the final line that you're hearing we brought him in but we got him to do that line on a telephone it was a telephone recording that that got him to do that um a lot i think i, I that don't was know the where big you speech were. i think too when i was talking on the phone was it to dale or denise is through the phone as well correct uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I okay. think that had been pre-recorded. That was done on the set, as I recall. We recorded oh, okay. a lot of his yeah. lines on the set. I mean, yeah. he was, he was, he was, um, Miko was just wonderful to work yeah. with. I loved yeah. working with you, Miko. You are such a sweetheart. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, had, we really, Miko and I had a great time together. There's pictures of me with Miko and it's like, uh, he's like, he's my baby, you know? Um, I love that. And, and then, you know, d um, d then I had a, a son, like two or three years later, and he looked just like Miko. I mean, he's like a little blonde baby. It was, um, it was kind of amazing. Uh, I don't know that I could have directed the movie after I'd had that son. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to be your practice baby. <laughs> Dale, I was hoping you could get into um, a discussion a little bit of how you became cast in this film. What was the process for that? Well, that's a horrible story. <laughs> No, I mean, I went in, I auditioned for Mary, mm -hmm. and then I auditioned with Denise for Mary, mm -hmm. and uh, that was it. We, uh, Mary took me aside, I remember. I don't know what she said, but it was very nice. <laughs> That's all I remember. <laughs> if I could remember the words, it's 30 years ago. You've got to give me a little break here. <laughs> <coughs> but she was very kind to me, and she said she wanted me in this film, and I said, oh, this is this sounds fun. It wasn't fun, but <laughs> <laughs> it was. I mean, it was you know a lot of emotion. It was very you know for a young man who doesn't have children. It was very heart wrenching to even think about that. But Mary was so kind, and she was friends with Denise, so that kind of made it easier too, you know. And uh, I guess that's how I got. It. Is, is that your memory of it? Or? Yeah, yes. But you know, I'm going to have to tell that story that I, we were just talking about up there. The best story about the whole movie with Dale is the scene where he wake when Pascal visits him in the dream. Uh -huh. Um, the the day after I sent those dailies to, uh, into Paramount, I get a call. We shot it the first time, and the first time we shot it, Dale was sleeping in his uh, uh, scrub pants without a shirt. So the first scene, the first time we shot it, he was shirtless. The, the worst call I got from Paramount on the whole show was the next day. He looked too sexy. <laughs> 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 they, made me re they made us reshoot that scene and put Dale in pajamas. <laughs> Distracting from the story with your massive <laughs> pecs. I was like, I was like, what? That's a good thing that he looks sexy. <laughs> Why not? Why can't he look sexy? No, um, and I was so insecure. I was like, I've got a scar on my chest. Maybe that was it. Maybe Dale they said he never me. knew. I don't know. I have didn't. body image problems. You know, <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know that until you told me that right up there. I, I couldn't believe you didn't know it. I mean, you know. I just thought I fucked up. You know, basically. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, Mary is just trying to make a movie for the female gaze, it turns exactly. out. I mean, if it had been a woman who had had her shirt off in, in a horror movie, they would have been fine. Oh, yeah. With it. yeah. yeah. Been, no boy, let's go. I've yeah. been fine with that. Yeah. Um, speaking of sexy, the shorts that Brad wears. Um, oh, they're red. Are they red or orange? They're reddish. Red they're reddish. Dish. I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Brad, when you were going through the script, your character has a kind of cheekiness to him. You know, he's, he's uh, I wouldn't say he's comic relief necessarily, but he kind of uh, enters the film in this way that you might expect in almost like a Shakespearean manner, you know. It, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that part and what drew you to it. Well, um, uh, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of this... Uh, Pascal is, is, well, provides the hope, the hope that everything's going to turn out okay, you know. And, and it's also, the, the, the role is also that kind of campy humor that all of Stephen King's early uh, films had, you know, like Creepshow and uh, things like that. They all had that very kind of uh, campy humor that's kind, that doesn't, it doesn't exist in horror films now. 
Um, but that's what that was. And so, so we were just playing around with it. Um, Mary, like, Mary just, sh she, she, she really, I, I mean, I would have made a complete fool of myself if it wasn't for Mary. <laughs> she really took care of me and gave me, like, like not extensive direction, but just, just these little things that, like, really, oh, okay, that's what it was, okay, you know, because, because I was pretty new and, and I wasn't sure about this role. I wasn't, and, and I wasn't a big, um, a uh, fan of contemporary horror films at the time. I, I was like really into the the universal gothic films, Frankenstein and all that. You We're, know, there are shades of this of, of those films. Yeah, in sorry, this, I, I, I couldn't help it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know. Does that answer your question? Kind of. I think so. Yeah. Okay. I Perfect. always thought of Pascal as the good an as the good angel who didn't look like the good angel. He's the good angel. He look he looks. Frightening and ghoulish and 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 terrifying, but he's the one who has the good advice. And whereas Fred Gwynn, who's like the sweet old man that lives next door, that he's the bad angel. And and, the and dark it, angel. he's the dark yeah. angel. And and you 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 know you, appearances are sometimes deceptive. Uh, I'm curious. You know, Brad, you were talking about Mary kind of supporting you on set. Uh, I have heard from interviews that you are interested when you're directing in doing some improvisation on set, Mary, where you want to get your actors into a yes and kind of thing. And I'm curious if you guys remember any of that from set kind of arriving at something as opposed to I it don't at all. But I, my, you know, I would like, I, I was there for one line. Like, I'd work <laughs> one day a week, spend like a gazillion hours in makeup, and then, uh, then I'd be, I'd have one line. Yeah, you're just gonna hang from a tree and say one line, okay? And then, you know, spend the the rest of the day getting all that makeup off, and then, you know, hanging around for another week. And then, <laughs> so there wasn't much <laughs> improvisation for one line. I think all of my lines were the scripted lines. I think. Well, we were also working from a Stephen King script, and we didn't do a whole lot of improvisation um, on this particular movie. I think, I think. Denise and um, Dale and I might have done some like improv warm up stuff, um, but sometimes when I say improvisation, I like to use improvisation in that way so that you improv with the actors. You improv a scene that might like where were you before? Where were you before you walked in the door? Let's yeah. improv w the conversation that you had as you walked up. The just street. to get loose just and to get loose some it. history on, and just yeah, yeah. But, but not to actually change the words of the scene or to come up with new dialogue. I'm, I'm curious, uh, I was hoping that we could get into some of the editing because we do have Tom in here and uh, a lot of um, what Mary's talked about in interviews around this movie and others is the dream logic of it, how you go from reality to something that is a heightened reality or a surreality. And there's um, an early cut, for instance, between um, you know a husband and wife kissing, and then the doctor goes off to the hospital, uh, to the university, and then all of a sudden we've got Brad's bloody head in the screen, and it's slow motion, a little bit jittery. And I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that process of constructing these things. I was just asking yeah. this, show, I mean, it, it was all Mary's vision. I mean, we had a DOP and all that, and he was fantastic, but it was Mary's vision that created all of that. Her Southern Gothic artistic sensibility created all of that. I mean, honestly, she's an artist first and foremost, you know. What and a sweet thing to say. Well, baby, I've always loved you, you know that. <laughs> I've always had a thing for you, well, you, you know, know that you too, right? <laughs> it's that whole Elvis thing that you do, oh, Dale. <laughs> I can't help it, honey. But it's true. I mean, it really was. It was all of her, you know. I, mean. I have a very, very prolific dream life. And I have a lot of nightmares. But I love them because they're so visual. And there is a, there is a logic that uh, – there's a, 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 an illogic to dreams. You can, there, you, you can make – your cuts don't have to match right. um, in, in, a, in dreams. But they have, but they have, to, they have to have impact. You know, just like you can you can um, talk your editor into doing ma cuts that don't match if they work, and you know if they work, like you know, how do you know yeah, that? You know, you know right away. You know right away. Uh, I think maybe with you more than any other director I've worked with, we kind of throw all of that out. I mean, we really do 
go to the gut of the of the scene or the or that particular piece of film. It really is uh, all emotion, I think, um, and and really not not pay too much attention to gee, does that match or does that uh, you know? It's it's uh, the linear story even gets thrown out. Obviously, we you know we jump all over the place, um, but yeah, I think I think with you more than. Anybody I would. <laughs> well, thank you all so, Tom. <laughs> Thanks for putting up with me because I'm, I'm pretty notorious for uh, lack of c continuity sometimes. Um, does that, I mean, does that make your script supervisor go insane? Well, actually, uh, <laughs> well, J Jesse was abducted by aliens. <laughs> what? That's, 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 that's a whole other story. That's another story. That's a whole other story. I was there that night. It's true. It's a <laughs> true story. He was. <laughs> um, I, I remember. I, I remember. Uh, he was. <laughs> in in pet two, the way Mary and I usually worked is we would come and we'd look at a scene or look at a a, a reel or or the whole cut, and uh, I would take notes. Uh, I think Mark Governor, our composer, was talking about. Uh, I always had a legal pad with me all the time and writing things down. Um, and so for the most part, I would I would make the changes while Mary was gone. We'd, we'd run it, or we'd make all the notes, and she'd say, I'll come back tomorrow or whatever. This and is cutting um, on film. Yeah, yes, <laughs> editing <laughs> on film, exactly, exactly. Um, but there's, in, in Pet 2, there was one particular thing you were looking for. You were looking for something, and you came in and we ran all the trims, which again, you didn't typically, and it's, it's, uh, it was a fight scene with, it, with uh, Eddie and, and, uh, and that was really fascinating for me. And what we ended up using is, of course, a piece that was slightly out of focus, probably before the slate um, that, that had just been stolen and, and Mary's eye caught it and knew exactly what she wanted and we put it in and it worked really well. Well, there's a, you know, there's just so many people that uh, contributed by, like, just being creators also, like Tom and, like, Mark Governor, who actually should probably be up on the stage. <laughs> and but when the next movie screens, um, th there's some... Um, uh, there's some musical moments that I, I just want to warn everybody about. There's some music cues that Mark wrote that, um, that are just so brilliant uh work so brilliantly with the um with the images uh especially the funeral scene wow he wrote the most amazing piece of music for the funeral scene and um the uh the camera russell Ca russell carpenter who uh went on to shoot titanic um and some other small movies um <laughs> <laughs> but but watch watch his uh the crane moves in pet two uh, and how they work with the music and just how how incredibly elegant and beautiful they are that there's that's is not drone you can, you know you're you're getting used to watching drone people using drones as cranes and it's 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 analog compared to digital um, when I I'm, I'm really excited to see these uh, crane moves on the big screen uh, co uh, coming up um, and also somebody that uh, th something else that I, I want to point out that's a continuity between the two movies is the sound mix by uh, uh, Chris Jenkins, who's yeah. won many Academy Awards. Yes, yes. Um, and I've forgotten how well, the, 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 the sound works so well. Larry Mann was our, our sound uh, supervisor mm -hmm. and worked so well drawing you in from scene to scene and uh, God, it was really good. Some of the sound in this, hearing it in a, an actual theater, it is disgusting at times. It is extremely unnerving. Um, I mean, if you could share anything about that process, I think it'd be great. Well, when Dale's head hits that nightstand, <laughs> that's that, we didn't have to re-record that. He really hit. I gave my all. He really did. Oh God. It was the crickets that really I, that I heard this time. The crickets. Yeah. And crickets have always freaked me out, but man. That was oh, just uh, one of the things that's in the book, and that that really it just it, it it's not as strong in the movie as I would like it to be. Is the idea that once the e once 
nature is disturbed and once um, people try to um, uh, change the natural order of things by bringing people back to life, then the evil spirits that uh, live in the pet, uh, you know, in the pet cemetery that live on the burial ground are, re are also released. And it's not just the, the cat or the person that comes back to life, but it's also the fact that this evil is able to creep out of the cemetery and enter the, you know, enter the, um, in start interfering with the lives of the people who touched it. And it's, it's strong in the book and it was really hard to do. Uh, for me, for me, because uh, I was such a, a fan of, of Stephen King early on, and I remember reading the book long before we worked on on this one, was the smell. How how Stephen uh, explained what what the smell was of of the of the people and the cats and the animals that, that came back. That of course we couldn't do here. We we said to you smell bad, but it was just one of those things you could never you could never pull off. But I think that the, was the two things I would do differently would be to uh, try to explain why Missy hangs herself. Like, you know, I don't know there was some mist coming down the uh, – something to show that, that the evil was reached. And I think I would have had Dale roll around in the dirt a little more up there in the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> but why? <laughs> that, he is, that you are so demented when you do that last laugh. We, that we, oh. we worked – you know, the idea was that, we, that he's, he's gone off the rails because why else would he – What's he going to tell his wife when the baby comes uh, back? Have you, have you spent any time in Maine? <laughs> You're going to go off the rails occasionally. You know that? What are you going to tell your father-in-law? I mean, he, he's not. He's oh, fuck him. Like I never <laughs> liked him. You know that. What on earth do you think you're going to tell him? I, I really, I think you might have had to eat some dirty. But oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> Those I, are the two things. Do I you remember the, the, the preview? Do you remember the great story out of the preview? Uh, uh, maybe not. Uh... I, and I tell this story all the time. So we previewed it in the Valley. We previewed it in Sherman Oaks. Um, and we you know, recruited audience. Uh, and we previewed it two nights, a Tuesday and a Thursday. So we did it, We did Tuesday, and then we made a few changes and stuff on Wednesday and previewed it again Thursday night. So full house, very quiet. Uh, this The scene where, where Fred Gwynn goes up to get... Uh, Gage, yes, exactly. And uh, so this was 89, um, and I, I didn't, it was before the days of, of YouTube and all that sort of stuff, and I had, I didn't realize that Fred Gwynn was so associated with Herman Munster, still, even 15 years later or whatever. And again, I, I, I just, I, again, I didn't, I, well, I know we did, maybe for us, I didn't think, yes, but I didn't think the kids that, that were in the, the audience that night, anyway, so you've got that scene, it's coming up, the music is getting really heavy, um, he takes out the pocket knife, again, dead silence, and he says, Gage, where are you? I've got a click. I've got something for you. And down in the fourth row, somebody yelled, get him, Herman. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it wiped out everything for the next five minutes. People were laughing so hard. Do you remember this, Mary? So, and it was, it was fantastic. Anyway, two nights later, we go out to the same theater. We're, we're doing it again. We get to that exact same scene, and this time, five people in unison say, "Get him, Herman!" <laughs> and it had the exact same response. We, it just it wiped out the whole theater. Wiped out. Yeah, very. Well, that funny. was you know that was a big concern of the producers, uh, in hiring Fred, that that he was going to be perceived as Herman Munster and it was going to be funny and it wasn't going to be scary. And I just knew that it didn't matter. You know, because it's really important in horror films that people can laugh. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, it, you have to break the tension, and it's just like with a nightmare. You know, the only way to really uh, destroy the power of a nightmare is to wake up and realize that it's funny. You know, well, why did why was the guy chasing you with a knife? You know, you know, I mean, and, and then he stopped, and then he decided not to. I don't know. You, if you retell a nightmare, if you wake up and you tell the nightmare out loud to yourself or to somebody else, it's, it's usually really funny. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I think that's an important thing. I, I really tried to explore that in, in Pet 2 with, yeah. uh, with Clancy. It um, is fun. 
you guys are going to have such a good time, especially if you've not seen it in a while or you haven't seen it at all. But that's that's something that, you know, you were talking before about what you can and can't do in horror or what was popular in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And this is a movie that is scary but fun. Mm -hmm. uh, both of these. Um, Pet Cemetery 2, I think you leaned into a little bit more of the kind of dark comedy with it because of Clancy's um, performance. You said, can you talk about that? A well, it was more? written with that in mind, uh, at least in my mind. <laughs> 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 it wasn't completely in the mind, uh, again, of, of the producers. And um, Mark Governor, who is out there, um, we uh, w one of the things that was really important to me in Pet 2 was the soundtrack. I, I wanted the whole soundtrack to just be sort of heavy metal electric guitar. Remember that first soundtrack, Tom? <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, to I wanted it to be right out of the head of a teenage boy because that's, you know, the movie's from the from the point of view of, of these two adolescent uh, boys. Um, and so that's why that I wanted the soundtrack to just be that. <coughs> I just wanted that um, crazy uh, electric guitar. Uh, but that it, it that met with enormous disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> the, the temp track did, um, but they, were. they th when I turned in that temp score, what happened, Tom? Yeah, w w it didn't. It made it through one screening and <laughs> pulled it all out and, and went with a more contemporary. Uh, no, I was told I was going to yeah. have to go to Europe and um, and and th they were going to do a cheap orchestral score yeah. in Europe with a new composer and 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 I, I you know I called up called up Mark my friend and colleague and collaborator and artist and um and I said we, we don't we can what what can we do to soften this up for them what can we do to make it more em, em, you know emotive and more empathetic um and uh and we did yeah um it's and it's I'm happy with great, it and I think it turned score. out great and sometimes sometimes you know especially if you're working you know within the system and um with a studio uh, f on a film that pe people want to be commercial and uh, expect it to be commercial and uh, they, they expect a product that they can sell. It's not, it, it stay in the editing room. I mean, that was that was the best piece of advice that was uh, given to me by Ralph Singleton, who's not here tonight. Yeah. Was like, d you know, d whatever you do, Mary, don't, uh, take such a hard position that you get thrown out of the editing room because then you will you'll lose the film and s and sometimes you listen um, You know you you make a compromise if you don't make too much of a compromise You actually get something that that works for everybody and um, and, and you reach a larger audience that way I'd still like to do a film with just <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd love to open it up to audience questions if anyone has anything that they'd like to ask anyone are you in the red shirt up there? Is it orange? I'm not sure. Um, and I think that we've got a microphone coming down to you, right? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, the 4K looks amazing, by the way, and sounded great. It's, I've never heard it like that before. I'm just curious about Stephen King. Was he on set a lot, other than the thing you shot? Like, was he involved at all besides his writing? He was there a good bit at the time. He was incredibly supportive. Um, there was a writer's strike on at the time, and so um, uh, we couldn't technically have uh, a writer make changes. Uh, I forget exactly what the rule was, um, but he, he was he, he was he was he was working it. <laughs> He was working it to really help me keep uh, to do the movie that I wanted, and also that he wanted. Um, and he was there a lot, but he, uh, but in a very, very supportive way. Um, and he was in Maine, so he was local because you guys shot. Yeah, in Maine. I mean that was that was one of his um, uh, um, calls. One of the things that he had the right to insist on was it uh, where the movie was going to be shot. He, he, when he, when it was in his contract that the movie would be shot in Maine, and I think it was because he wanted to be able to check in. The second um, one was in Atlanta. Yeah, God. <laughs> <laughs> doubling, doubling poorly for Maine. Well, it, uh, Michelle Minch isn't here tonight, but I think she did a really good job of like 
uh, on the interiors, you'll see, especially when you see the vet's office. It, 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 the wallpaper in there is very reminiscent of the wallpaper in Judd's house. Little, little, little things like that that, um, that tie the two movies together. Stephen was around for uh, a lot of our rehearsals. That's true. At the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, he'd come in and he'd have the old chain with the wallet, dressed like a motorcycle guy, <laughs> and he'd sit there and he'd drink uh, cans of Jolt. You know, if you've never had it, it's you know four times the sugar, three times the caffeine of anything you've ever had in your life. And he'd pound it down, and he would sit there and he would read out loud from the obituaries. I think it was just a shock effect thing for us, but it was fucking fascinating. It was lovely to watch. And he was so sweet to all of us. I mean, if we had any questions, except for Fred. I think Fred pissed him off a little bit because Fred said to me, I'm going to pick his brain. I'm going to pick his brain all day. I want to find out everything Stephen King has in his brain. And he would literally follow <laughs> Stephen King around. And Stephen was like, oh, yeah, i got to go get a jolt. And, I just <laughs> and but it was very funny. It's, and I don't think Fred ever picked his brain because... <laughs> But Stephen was very sweet, as Mary was saying. He was just, he was very, very, very comforting, you know. And it was actually, Maine was so weird. It was, <laughs> it wasn't it? It was like, there, were, there was a flag and then a cemetery and a flag. And it's any road you drove down, you know. And but that skylight, that beautiful, you know, it skylight. It was so you beautiful and so Maine. weird. Right. It was so beautiful and that, so weird. That you got in the shots, which was perfect. <laughs> And that's also something that sets this movie apart from others, that you are using bright colors in daylight in a horror film. Mm -hmm. And it's something that is very memorable and really fascinating, too. I think there's a lot of scary stuff that happens during the daytime. We'll leave it at that. So, uh, yeah, you got a question right there. And we've got a microphone coming down to you. Maybe he's going to ask you more questions about the light. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Thank you guys for being here, by the way. I, my question, Mary, was, to my knowledge, this was the first big endeavor that Elliot Goldenthal had worked on. <laughs> so I wanted to know uh, what your story was, how you found him. Uh, were there any other composers, perhaps, that you had in mind if you didn't settle for on him? Or not settle, but choose him? Thank well, um, Elliot was living in New York with uh, his uh, girlfriend, uh, Julie Taymor, at the time. Uh, there's, there's still a couple. and. Um, they were living in Soho, and I was familiar with that the whole art scene in Soho because because that's what it was at that time. It wasn't like a shopping mall like it is now. Um, people lived in lofts and they built made puppets. And uh, he had done this a score for um, uh, some of her puppet shows because that this was before The Lion King. This was when Julie Taymor was doing puppet shows in Soho, and so I knew them. I didn't know them personally, but I knew his work from from that time, and um, his um, I knew his uh, uh, representative, his his agent, uh, because of the music videos. I don't know, just because of my connections in the music industry. Um, and he suggested Elliot. Uh, his agent did, and uh, I'm like, wow, that's a great idea. Um, and you know, then I listened more closely to Elliot's work and I met with him and Elliot's just a crazy, he's a crazy artist. He's a, he's a, um, you know, he just joined the people at the aside, the crazy house where we were working. <laughs> um, anyone else? All oh, right, over here. Uh, something I noticed on this beautiful 4K that I didn't notice as strongly on cable or VHS or however I saw it before were the paintings kind of looming in the background of the houses, <laughs> uh, especially at the tops of stairs. And I was curious uh, about those paintings, like how, you know, was that something that came from you or a uh, set deck or just how, what the origins of that were? And then if there were artists that influenced uh, you in how some of the things looked, like there were some artists that I sort of was reminded of in the nightmare version of Judd's house. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, the paintings uh, were a detail that I thought was really important to the theme that we were talking about, about accepting death. And um, uh, I really 
I really, when Gage comes back in the little blue suit, I really wanted him to come back in a way that was um, terrifying. Uh, and uh, the portraits, like the portrait of the little boy that hangs over the mantelpiece uh, in, um, in the house in Chicago, it's, a, um, it's meant to be, uh, people used to, well, in the 1800s and the early 1900s um, in this country, early 1800s even, late 1700s, there, there was really high infant mortality because of childhood diseases, because people didn't vaccinate their children. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, very often uh, after a child would die, they would do portrait, they would dress the child up in its, uh, the clothes that it was going to be buried in, and they would have a portrait done so they could remember the child because photography was not, you know, everybody didn't have cameras on their cell phones back then either. Um, so uh, it would be the only way to remember your child who died in, in, in you know, as a, as, a, as a toddler or a small child. And so these portraits, if you've ever seen them, they're super creepy. Um, but you can, you know, you kind of sense something about them. And I, I really wanted that that undertone of, of like, this is creepy, but I don't know why. And this is scary, just like in a nightmare, you know, because you, you don't know why it's scary, because in a nightmare, you're refusing to listen to your subconscious, which is trying to tell you something. So you, you bury the reason it's scary. So those, those paintings were very carefully thought out, and they were very intentional. And um, in terms of being influenced by painters, I'm, I'm always interested I'm always influenced by painters. I, I studied painting. I did not go to film school. I went to Rhode Island School of Design before they had a, 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 fil um, a, a film department. I, I, I was working with film there, but I, I, um, I love painting. I, I'm not, I, can't, I can't give you a painter off the top of my head that, um, that influenced that living room, but, but I'll think about it and tweet you, okay? <laughs> yeah, you do work a lot with paintings and photographs mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. foreshadowing and, and uh, capturing death and the, the endurance of life through that. Um, I think that we have to wrap it up because we have to get the Pet Cemetery 2 screening going, but if you could all please give a hand for all these wonderful people who help make this amazing movie. And again, a wonderful hand to K.J. Ralph over here and the rest of the Billy Wilder Theater at the uh, UCLA Film and Television Archive who made this entire week impossible, and they're so amazing. I can't believe that they put all of this together. But please enjoy Pet Cemetery too. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, April.